Greetings and welcome to part 7 of our video series showing how to hand build a vintage amplifier. In this case, a, a model 6422 Supro Tremo Verb. In this episode, we're going to uh, finish the chassis, paint it, letter it, and then uh, do about one half of the point to point wiring with all sorts of little tips and tidbits along the way. As you can see, I'm using a specially made uh, schematic for this project, which was very kindly made by a viewer and is available uh, at a link which I will post uh, in the video description. It should be noted that this schematic is a work in progress and uh, is changed almost daily. In fact, there's a couple changes that were going to be made to this particular schematic so there may be some problems if you are trying to work concurrently with me and uh, build your version of the Supro Tremor Verb based on this schematic. Uh, you might be better off waiting until my project is finished and the schematic is perfected. So as always, thanks for watching and let's get started. You ready? We're ready for this new video, aren't we? Man. Here's the speaker baffle painted flat black. This way, no matter what the lighting is, you won't be able to see anything behind the grill cloth. Okay, here's the chassis with all the terminal strips riveted in. And as you can see, there's plenty of terminals for the tubes and for the jacks. And then up here at this end, the controls will have all sorts of terminals to communicate with. And then they can jump across for connections. Uh, here is for the filter capacitors that will be crossways uh, and you can see here if we have a capacitor here and here and you need a resistor then it'll just jump from one loop to the next and we also have the hole here for the power cord which will come up this way around and to the uh, fuse and switch and then to the transformer as you can see the high voltage will be on this end and the preamp tubes and the input uh, will all be down at this end as far away as possible. I'm also going to use shielded cables for signal runs from one side to the other. And then for fans of that steampunk rivet look, check out the back of the chassis with all the rivets. Looks like Captain Nemo's submarine, the Nautilus. Okay, I decided to go with a conventional method here on the chassis and I'm spraying it with gold lacquer, several coats all the way around and on the back and uh, then I'm going to try the rub on letters on the control panel uh, to see if uh, I can get them to stick properly and then I'll clear coat it. Those uh, wells did turn out pretty nice over here. Okay, let's see how it turns out. Okay, here's the back sprayed came out real nice I think. Now let's see about those rub-on letters. Okay, here's the bottom of the chassis all lettered uh, for the tubes and the output jacks and I've clear coated it and it came out really nice I think. And here's the control panel all painted, lettered, all done in-house and ready for the installation of the components. Well, here's the tube side all assembled, and I can tell you that nothing feels better after days of bending steel and, and uh, welding and painting and lettering that finally when you get to uh, start assembling and, and installing components, it's a great feeling. Here's the outside and here's the inside with the terminal strips ready to be connected. Okay, next, uh, the control side. Okay, here's the control panel all assembled. And you can see inside, everything's looking really nice. Now it's time to install the transformers. Okay, now the transformers are securely attached to the rear of the chassis. Um, the wires are running through those protective grommets. I even got the screw heads to all line up to make it look particularly nice. Let's take a look inside. 
Okay, here we are looking inside. I'm going to show you a couple highlights and explain them. First, before I put uh, crank the nuts down on the power transformer, I put a uh, grounding lug under two of them. This will be the ultimate ground in the amp because when the three wire cord comes in, the green grounding wire is also going to go to one of these grounding lugs. This is a great place to ground the center taps. Uh, on your power transformer winding and also it's a great ground for your filter capacitors over here in your power supply. Okay let's move on down here to the output transformer and as you can see there's four wires coming through this lower grommet. Uh, these are the black which is uh, ground and then the 4, 8 and 16 ohm speaker uh, outputs which will be going right here to these jacks. I'm not going to hook up the 16 ohm, but I'm going to have a 4 and 8. So you, as you can see, look how close that is. That's uh, what you have to keep in mind when you design your chassis. Next we have the primary inputs to the output transformer. And as you can see, it's a straight shot right down here to the either 6V6 or 6L6, whichever happens to be in the tube socket. Now last but not least, here is our uh, reverb driver transformer. And because of the way this was laid out, the tubes that it communicates with are right here. And the jacks by which it communicates to the tank are right here. So as you can see, just as close and convenient as it could be. And I'd like to add, before I do start wiring, that this is really the most rewarding part, I think, of any amplifier building project simply because it's starting to take shape. It's starting to reward you for all your hard work. Uh, all that beating on an old a sheet of 16 gauge steel and all that drilling and machining and drawing and planning and, and uh, ordering uh, parts and then uh, reordering the ones you forgot to order. Finally, you start to have some visual payoff for all of that work. And I want to tell you, it's, it's really exciting and it really makes it all worthwhile. Until, of course, the first time you plug it in and then it catches fire and burns your house down. But that's another story. Okay, before we continue, let's have a brief discussion uh, about different types of solder. First is the traditional lead 6040 rosin core solder. Um, this is what's been used forever. Uh, it melts at a fairly low temperature and flows very well. But it also um, has lead in it and that makes people nervous. So they created a lead-free type of solder which actually has silver in it. It's much more expensive of course. Um, it melts at a higher temperature. It doesn't flow as well. And uh, to be honest, uh, because of the ease of using the lead-based solder, it's what I use exclusively. If I want to solder two pieces of metal together, I would probably use this. You're free, of course, to use whichever one you like. And if lead makes you nervous, then by all means use the lead free. Also, you're going to need a type of soldering paste. It's really a nasty looking, sort of like beeswax looking uh, material. And this really aids in the adhesion of the solder to metal. Now notice that the wires are looped through the holes and crimped down so that they make good contact with the, with the lugs, the tube lugs. Now the purpose of solder isn't to make a connection, it's just to stabilize it. So we want to make sure that we have decent connections. I'm going to go back and tighten that one and uh, then we apply the solder. And there they are, all soldered up. Try to wiggle them, make sure that they can't move around, that they're nice uh, and absolutely solid. Uh, Jack, what are you doing in the bathtub? You get out here and help me. Oh. I'm in the midst of wiring the Supro chassis and I came up with what I think is an error in the original schematic. If you look here at the B plus coming out of the 5Y3 rectifier you see that it's filtered by a 20 at 450 filter cap which is standard. Now we come over here and without any resistor in between there's another 20 at 450 filter cap, which means they are in parallel and uh, equate to a 40 microfarad filter capacitor. Now the tube handbook says that the maximum first filter capacitor for a 5Y3 is 20 microfarads. This is double 
what is acceptable and would cause an early demise of the rectifier tube. I believe there should be some sort of resistance right here so that it uh, is actually 220s instead of 140. So my solution is this. Uh, if you notice there is a 1000 ohm 1 watt resistor between node 1 and node 2. I'm going to break that 1000 into two 500s. So I'm going to put a 500 ohm resistor here before the second 20 and then I'll put another 500 ohm resistor here before the second node. The total voltage drop is the same so that the screen voltage will be correct but we have an additional low pass filter here that's created by this uh, resistance and the 20 microfarad capacitor. No longer does the rectifier see 40 microfarads it's going to see two 20s which it can handle quite easily. Here we have the B plus coming off of the rectifier tube and up here to this first lug. It's filtered by the first 20 microfarad cap to ground. Then it passes through 500 ohms of resistance to the second lug. I didn't have a 500 ohm 2 watt resistor so I used two 1000s in parallel which doubles the heat dissipation and gives me 500 ohms. Uh, this second lug here after the 500 ohms is going to be filtered by the second 20. Then we'll go through another 500 ohms here, again two 1000s in parallel, to the third position that's filtered by 10 microfarads, and then through the 15K resistor right here to the fourth a capacitor which is 10 microfarads where it's filtered again. Notice that the secondary AC outputs from the power transformer are twisted uh, here to the 6.3 volts uh, lugs of the of the tubes and over here to the 5 volt lugs of the rectifier. You always twist your AC wires to cut down on any sort of hum possibility. Here's the high voltage going to the plates of the rectifier also twisted. Here is the center tap for the high voltage and the center tap for the 6.3 volt winding grounded to a grounding lug that's bolted under the transformer. Here's our three wire cord input. Green wire goes right to the grounding lug that's bolted under the transformer. The white lead comes over here and I solder it to a terminal to uh, stabilize it and then from that terminal I run into the primary of the uh, power transformer. The black wire from the cord which is the hot wire is going to come up here through the power switch and then once you flip it on it will come over here to the fuse. If the fuse is in place and, and not blown uh, it comes out of the fuse and back into the primary winding of the transformer closing the circuit and turning on the amplifier. Here's our reverb uh, driver transformer connected to the two plates of the 12AT7 and then over here to the output uh, for the shielded cable that's going to go to the tank. The red wire comes over here to the second node of the power supply. Here we have the output transformer secondary. The black wire goes to the grounds of the two jacks. The green, which is 8 ohms, connects to the 8 ohm jack. The yellow, which is 4 ohms, goes down to the 4 ohm jack. These are ungrounded because if uh, they were self-grounding jacks, one or the other, the one not being used, would be a dead short for the output transformer. Now let's look at the primary of the output transformer. Uh, the blue lead is the common lead and will go to the uh, first node of the power supply. Then depending on the load resistance of the tube that we use, if it's 5k ohms then the brown wire will go to its plate. If it's 8k ohms the red wire will go to its plate. Uh, with the 6v6 I'm going to use the 5k lead to the plate and then I'm going to park the 8k uh, lead where it can't get into any trouble. And here we see the blue lead goes to the first node of the power supply. The red wire is parked. That's the 8K ohm load resistance. And the 5K ohm load resistance comes over here to the plate pin of the 6V6 or 6L6. 
And down here the screen voltage for the 66 comes off of the second node of the power supply. Okay, now it's time to install my first shielded cable between my input jacks and the first preamp tube grid. Um, you start here by stripping about an inch from the end. Then you strip the inner wire. This will be the signal. And then twist the shield wires here into a little pigtail. At the other end, uh, there's no need to twist the pigtail, but you cut it off all the little wires flush with the outer insulation which is black in this case and uh, I always use some heat shrink because one hair from the shield could cause a dead short. Okay here's the wiring to the two input jacks with the ground that is riveted to the chassis. Here is the shielded cable that is carrying the signal over to the grid of the uh, first 12AX7 and you notice that you only ground a shielded cable at one end the reason is rather complex, but if you ground at both ends, you can create something called a ground loop, which will actually cause hum. Okay, so ground at one end. Okay, now all the 6.3 volt uh, AC wiring is in place. This is for the pilot light. You notice how it's tightly twisted and comes down from above on the socket instead of coming wrapping around like a snake around the socket. You want it to come down. Um, here it comes down this way to this terminal strip and then it feeds all four of the 12 AX7s. Here's the tremolo wiring. Uh, remember that there's three capacitors that form that phase shifting loop 0 0.01, 0 0.01 and 0 0.03 and they communicate with this tube right here which is the tremolo tube. Then the cathode bias switch has been wired to the socket. That's the cathode pin. Comes over here to the middle lug and then depending on which way the toggle is flipped you'll either get the cathode uh, bias resistor that's suitable for the 6V6. And I'm going to start with a 330 ohm resistor that they show in the schematic and then adjust it if necessary. And then down here I'll have to figure out what's appropriate for a 6, uh, L6 and install it from here to ground. Well, that's about it for part 7 of our video series. Uh, please be sure to join me in part 8 where the wiring will hopefully be completed and we might even be able to fire this beast up. Okay, I hope to see you then. Thanks for watching. One final word before we conclude part 7 and that is that I strongly advise anyone who intends to build an amp like this to become completely familiar with all of the safe procedures and precautions that are required to work safely around high voltage electricity. Uh, Rusty and I really love our viewers and don't want anything bad to happen to you. So be sure you're ready before you start a project like this. Okay you crazy parakeets, I need help with this video and I don't care where I get it. So I want you out of that cage and into the workshop. Are you ready to help? No, you're getting more like Rusty and Jack every day.